now you are recording good morning everyone i would like to welcome everyone to the second oration in memory of our great mentor professor shushil kumar professor shushil kumar memorial oration is a respectable tribute to the legend by his students and admirers with this event we hope to translate his thoughts into expressions and revive the visions he left behind we have our chief guest of the event dr ak singh director icr iari as well as guest of honor dr ad patak with us today who will join us shortly we are having a special presence of dr ajit shashni director csir national botanical research institute who happens to be professor shushil kumar student and dr manoj prasad senior scientist a national institute of plant genome research our inaugural speaker of the series we are also delighted to have dr d k yadav with us uh, so we are very delighted to have you all on the forum sir uh, now from ffsf we have professor s p s kanuja monsa dr a k singh and dr r p bansal with us today so with this brief i welcome our viewers here and uh, all the dignitaries and request professor s k s kanuja to begin the session with his remarks thank you dr manika uh, a warm welcome uh, dr ashok kumar singh who is our uh, oration speaker today on second memorial oration lecture of in memory of professor sushil kumar and all dignitaries uh, who are present here including Dr. Shashni, Director NBRI, Dr. Manoj Prasad, uh, and uh, we will have Dr. Pathak joining us uh, soon. Uh, and all those who are uh, listening to us, I welcome you all to this uh, very important platform of Flora Fauna Science Foundation and Professor Sushil Kumar School, uh, which uh, basically is a group of his students, admirers, and those whom he had mentored, including some of uh, the entrepreneurs. so all of you are welcome uh, to join us in uh, remembering dr sushil kumar not just by words but also by deeds uh, where we we try to bring in the experts from national level who uh, give to us the vision and the possible direction with which we can translate what professor sushil kumar always used to uh, dream uh, i am delighted to say that both myself and uh, dr ashok kumar singh are also students of uh, professor sushil kumar and that way we have a double connect uh, dr ashok kumar singh now currently as a director of uh, iari but basically from genetics division and again professor sushil kumar and we uh, originated from genetics division of iari only so it's a triplet which uh, works uh, very well uh, we uh, always uh, begin with uh, something which is visionary uh, but before that uh, we also remember some of uh, the things about uh, professor sushil kumar uh, professor sushil kumar i would say uh, if i have to define in terms of flora and fauna he is a blessing of the nature uh, somehow i am not still able to digest that he is no more he lives in me he lives in us and we want to keep his uh, torch uh, you know always lighted up and take what he used to say or what he used to do with some of the little bits that we can do in his much much greater uh, vision uh, those of you who have uh, not seen professor sushil kumar very closely let me tell you he he has been a man who never bothered that what facility is lacking what manpower is lacking or anything lacking in system he always believed in that let's move forward uh, just to uh, i recall that in uh, uh, in 1980s early 80s when in fact in 82 when i joined him so when i went to him as student who wanted to opt him as supervisor for phd he said why do you want to come to me so i said sir i want to do molecular genetics he said yes it's a fashionable uh, term but what i have here is an autoclave and agar only so if you are happy with that then uh, you will have to work hard even for repairing of uh, uh, the autoclave and uh, many incubators and ovens and all that this we do ourselves 
So I didn't believe actually that this would be happening. I thought he is just uh, preparing me to be uh, ready for any hardship. But later I found that because of the resource crunch, I had to go to Kurulba, get an electrician, and then get our uh, thing repaired. And while doing that, we started learning how to repair ourselves. And we will bring the element and do it ourselves. So that is the type of training he would uh, give to us. On the other hand, on science and academics, if you say his teaching, it's unmatchable. The way he used to articulate on topics which were very, very difficult, you know, moving from plant to bacteria and bacteria to bacteriophage and from bacteriophage back into life uh, was the way he would uh, teach us. And uh, his favorite plant was uh, garden pea. Uh, as you know, Mendel uh, worked on pea and uh, Dr. Sushil Kumar used to love it. And also whatever be his projects, he would not leave pea. So among students, no, we will also call him Mendel sometimes that he is uh, a Mendel. So uh, even his observation power was like that. And uh, uh, in fact, I uh, when I joined him, I was not uh, his Arjun. I was like Eklavya. He, he would not like me to be in the lab, uh, but I would always uh, peep into the window and see how he's working and so on. But once I produced the results, the first experiment he gave me is to isolate bacteriophage of rhizobium from field of chickpea rhizobium. And I had to literally scan the whole library and ultimately I reached to 1936 where I got a method where they had done it. And when I did it, it did not repeat. So I had to uh, literally, you know, for six months, I was not able to get any results. And when I got results, I went to him, I showed him the plate that here are the plaques of uh, bacteriophage of uh, rhizobium. He just stood up and patted me and then said, come to the lab. And then onwards, I was his Arjuna. Before that, I had to be a Klavya. So, and that also I feel that was a way of uh, training the students to become worthy of becoming students. Although I have seen him as teacher as well as my boss. So I was his subordinate at IARI and then he left IARI all of a sudden and went to CSI. I never knew that I am also going to do it one day. So uh, then it so happened that uh, I also moved uh, after six, seven years to CMAP and then established molecular biology laboratory there. Earlier biotechnology at CMAP was tissue culture, but then we brought in molecular biology. And I had a team of five people out of those, one is present today here, Dr. Hajit Kumar Shasani, who now is director of NBRI uh, in CSIR. Earlier, he was director at NIPB in ICAR. So that's the lineage that we have. And uh, uh, with this, and also remembering MBB 100, which uh, Dr. Ashok Kumar Singh also would be remembering, it used to be a very diffi diffi different and difficult course for students, but we always try to make it exciting and uh, the way to do that was that the teacher has to be with students throughout uh, the practicals and uh, has to be um, much ahead of time when you are teaching theory part of it so i'll not take more time i'll i feel that uh, the topic that has been picked up for today which is transforming agriculture uh, for the survival of the planet now that is very very relevant because today we are passing through uh, the phase of agriculture where agriculture itself is getting criticized i'm not talking of any institution or anything people even some lobbies have started saying that agriculture brings in pollution or chemicals and so on and so many terminologies are coming up but perhaps this is a time when we have to think that agriculture is not seed to seed agriculture is much beyond and much earlier so it it is a value chain which is much bigger and also that it is not necessary that whole agriculture is done in land or soil. They can be landless agriculture. And even today we are talking of plantless agriculture, where we have cell agriculture as the way forward. And captive agriculture in which CPCT at IARI is doing wonderful uh, models, which uh, perhaps uh, tomorrow everyone would be doing, whether you have fertile land or you have barren land. You will have to do because 
per capita land availability is going to shrink. It is already shrinking, but it's going to be much, much a difficult resource. So is water and even air, the pure air is going to be difficult. So I'm sure Dr. Ashok Kumar Singh is going to throw light on all these aspects that how future agriculture would look like I am there with their research advisory uh, council and I always see the way he uh, leads the team from front and uh, always, uh, you know, uh, believes in evolution of uh, the scientists and research that can according to time change. So uh, with this, I stop here. I'll uh, request uh, Dr. Manika to take it further. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, as you told, and we cannot wait to listen our chief case. But before proceeding, and although he doesn't need an introduction, but I still request Dr. A.K. Singh to please introduce him to our new viewers. So please. Thank you, Manika. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Dr. Ashok Kumar Singh, to the participants of Professor Sushil Kumar Memorial Orisa. Dr. Ashok Kumar Singh was born in a farmer's family in village Varahad, Gajipur, Uttar Pradesh, on 1st of July, 1962. Dr. Ashok Kumar Singh did his graduation and post-graduation in genetics and plant breeding from PHU, Varanasi, and PhD in genetics from uh, IRI, New Delhi, in 1992. Dr. Singh joined as director IRI, New Delhi, on 15th of January, 2020. Earlier, he worked as a joint director, research in charge and head division of genetics in IRI, New Delhi, as Professor Khanuja told you. Dr. Singh had been actively involved in uh, Asmati rice improvement for the last two and a half decades. He is associated with development of 13 rice varieties, including five MAS derived Basmati varieties, three improved Basmati varieties occupy about 1.8 million hectares of land in our country, bringing prosperity to millions of Basmati farmers. Might be knowing, while earning uh, about 25,000 crores of worth foreign exchange annually, which is a great achievement for our country. Singh had published about 120 peer reviewed uh, research publication in rice genetics, molecular breeding, and grain quality. He co authored a book also. Marker Assisted Plant Breeding Principles and Practices, published by Springer. Dr. Singh pioneered the public private partnership model for commercialization of aromatic rice hybrid, Pusa RH10, and several Basmati rice varieties, generating revenue of about two crores. He has been awarded the prestigious uh, ICR Rafi Ahmed Kidwai Award and ICR Bharat Ratna, Dr. C. Subramaniam Award. He has also been recognized with the Best Teacher Award, uh, 2002, IRI BP PAL Award, 2007, ICR Special Recognition Certificate, 2009, Agriculture Leadership Award, 2011, Borlaag Award, 2012, Dr. A.S. Chima Award, 2012, and Sri Om Prakash Basin Award, 2017. So he had many prestigious awards to his credit. He is fellow of Indian National Science Academy, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences 2011, Indian Society of Genetics and Plant Breeding, and National Academy of Sciences India. With this brief introduction, I would like to request you uh, for uh, your oration, uh, Professor Sushil Kumar Memorial Oration. And the topic, as uh, Professor Khanuja had told you, transforming Indian agriculture for planet survival. Dr. Singh, please. Mute yourself. Please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Raksha, for your uh, kind words. Uh, it's my pleasure, and I'm gr grateful to uh, Flora and Fauna Foundation for inviting me for a second Professor Sushil Kumar uh, Memorial Oration. Uh, I will share my slides. Uh, uh, let me just try and I hope it uh, works. Uh, this one. Okay. Is it there? It's there. 
Good. So it's working, working. Please go ahead. It's not the first slide. Uh, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. So, uh, Professor Kanuja said, uh, you know, a number of things about uh, Professor Sushil Kumar. I pay my gratitude to him. And his persona can be best described in words of William Shakespeare. Uh, I would request each one of you to kindly read Current Science uh, Obituary that has been written about Professor Sushil Kumar. And uh, uh, if you uh, read this sentence uh, from William Shakespeare, his life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man, this was a man. Uh, even today, when I walk in the campus, I can uh, feel a person with fair complexion, well-built, cycling from Pusha Gate to another building with a Khadi Jhola hanging in his right shoulder, a researcher and teacher par excellence. You can feel every day presence of uh, Professor Susit Kumar. Uh, and he has been a great source of inspiration as a teacher, as a researcher for each one of us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Manoj uh, has also joined. I also see Professor Rishi Muni Singh, my elder brother uh, from Banaras Hindu University. He has also joined. Uh, Dr. Sasne and uh, Professor Kanuja. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Let me confess that I joined the Malbay 100 course and after four lectures, as you said, it used to be very difficult. I, I had to leave it. And if I had continued possibly, I would have been a molecular biologist today, not a plant breeder. Uh, Dr. Susil Kumar was such a wonderful teacher. He will come in the class an hour before. And uh, it was a long board in another building uh, lecture theater uh, that he will draw the, the structures and the pathways and so on and so forth. The entire board will be filled before the students enter in the class. And many times that job was done by uh, Professor Kanuja. Uh, after Professor Sushil Kumar, he continued with molecular biology 100 course, uh, uh, teaching for a very, very long time with the same zeal and spirit as Professor Susil Kumar used to, date, used to do. So my gratitude and uh, homage to Professor Susil Kumar for a wonderful person, a man of few words, very straightforward. He will never miss word. He will say uh, what is uh, true, what is right, uh, without uh, really fearing for what people think about it. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, start this presentation on transforming agriculture uh, for planet. And uh, in this, uh, you know, as you know, that the role of Indian Agriculture Research Institute from beginning is starting from 1905 when British realized that uh, we need to do uh, research uh, internally to address the local problem. And that's how the Institute was established in 1905. It completed in 2006, uh, you know, 100 years. And with the Green Revolution, the first stamp was released in 1968 as uh, you know, Gehu Utpadan Mikranti. And you can see that bar uh, from nine, in 1951, the wheat production, and then 1968, there was a sudden jump because of the uh, green revolution that happened. Uh, at that time, point of time, our major concern was having a day meal. And uh, you all remember, uh, at least those, uh, the, the people even, we uh, vividly remember the uh, situations when the uh, red wheat from uh, US used to come under public law 480 scheme. And our prime minister had to go and request for it. And you can see in this picture, 1966, Madam uh, Indira Gandhi uh, with President Johnson. Uh, later, uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri ji had to go and ask for uh, support in terms of wheat for meeting our food demand. And uh, there has been a long journey since then. If we look at the kind of revolution that we have seen, be it green revolution, white revolution, blue revolution, yellow revolution, golden revolution, silver revolution, brown revolution, and gray revolution. 
This is what agricultural revolutions that have happened in India that has transformed Indian agriculture. Uh, once I was talking to Dr. Swaminathan and uh, as to why the Green Revolution was named as Green Revolution, this was uh, named by William S. Gaud. Uh, and Dr. Swaminathan described the region for it was that uh, it is the green color of plant, the chlorophyll, which has the uh, ability to capture the solar radiation and convert it in form of carbohydrate in, through the process of uh, photosynthesis. So this is power of greenness of the plants, and that's how this was called as green uh, revolution. Uh, if you look at the production in 1950-51, it was just 50 million tons of food grain, and now our current uh, projection for 2023 is 323 million tons, which has increased by 6.4 times. Likewise, in all other commodities, egg in particular, 127 times increase in terms of egg production in the country that has happened. Uh, the two crops is still we are lagging behind one uh, pulses. We need to do much better. And oil seeds is a major challenge. Our current import of edible oil is uh, approximately 1,50,000 crores. And this is a huge drain on our forex in terms of edible oil import. We are earning uh, through export of certain commodities like uh, rice, but that gets offset by the uh, foreign exchange, uh, you know, investment that happens on the oil seed. And that's where I think priority uh, has to go for future agriculture. Now, if you look at the uh, production increase, as I said, three to 127 times in case of egg, 127 times and crops, uh, you know, three times to four times production has happened. But area, if you look at it, has remained constant over a period of time. And therefore, this uh, gain has come primarily because of improvement of productivity in case of cereals from 0.7 tons per hectare to 2.3 tons per hectare in 2022 overall, if you see. Also, uh, what research uh, in Indian agriculture has done is uh, it has brought is stability and resilient to climatic conditions. Earlier, the fluctuations uh, between years, for example, if you see 2001 and 2002, there is a sudden drop of almost 30 million tons because of climatic aberrations. Uh, we have seen these climatic aberrations last year also because of high temperature stress in case of wheat, but these are uh, minimized and therefore uh, primarily because of the climate resilient technology in terms of varieties, in terms of uh, production technology which have been developed. Uh, has played an important role in stabilizing uh, production. Not only that, the emission of uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gases per ton of food grain produced uh, has also declined substantially by 20%. Uh, although emission uh, per area has increased because of extensive use of uh, fertilizers and so on, but uh, per unit of grain production, uh, the emission has uh, declined. Uh, if we compare some of the leading countries like, you know, uh, US, uh, Brazil, and China, uh, India is doing better than many other countries, uh, but uh, it's still, you know, one of the major challenges before Indian agriculture remains is the availability of water per capita in terms of cubic meter, uh, which is in a country like what Brazil is about uh, 27,000, and we are much less at 1,200. This is going to be a major you know, concern for future agriculture and technologies have to evolve in that direction. The major challenges of uh, Indian agriculture uh, are therefore decreasing mm -hmm. water availability, degrading soil, increasing pests and diseases, intensifying the climate change that is having uh, with higher intensity, and also with the increased incomes, the aspirations of people are changing. And all this has to be addressed with the newer technologies uh, in terms of uh, profitable agriculture. Uh, if you look at the projection target for 2047 uh, against 2023, and why 2047? Because uh, uh, 2047, uh, we will be completing 100 years of uh, independence. And uh, this uh, last 25 years time of 100 years is described as Amrit Kal. So if you see where we are in 2023 and where we want to be in 2047, 
our population is going to rise to 1.6 billion. The food grain production has to increase to 520 million tons, fruit production to 200 million tons. Uh, and uh, uh, many of these uh, factors have to increase, but along with that, we have to improve the mechanization, we have to improve post-harvest losses. It has to reduce from 15 to 5%, and water efficiency from 40% to 70% has to increase, and nitrogen efficiency has to increase from 35 to 60%. So these are the projections which have been fixed uh, to be achieved by the Indian agriculture uh, in 2047 as against what we are today, and that is the Amrit Kal period. Uh, therefore, to address these problems, uh, I am looking at some of these points which I am going to address in this presentation in next, uh, say, 35 minutes or so, uh, how molecular breeding has come for help uh, in improving production, productivity, and stability, crop biofortification for alleviating nutritional hunger, then newer technologies like genome editing, transgenics, and speed breeding uh, to accelerate the breeding program, then how to address climate change and uh, what role regenerative agriculture can play uh, and how satellite drone remote sensing technologies can help making agriculture more precise. And uh, then uh, uh, ultimately, and finally, the mighty microbiome, a topic that was very close to the heart of Professor Sushil Kumar uh, and the potential that you see in terms of uh, use of uh, microbiological power for future agriculture is huge. Uh, if we see the plant breeding, uh, we have had a number of, uh, you know, if we consider plant breeding, uh, you know, it, in a toolbox, the number of tools that are available uh, from beginning, if you look at, you know, from selection to mutation to cross breeding uh, to tissue culture, smart breeding, genetic engineering, hybrid breeding and so on and so forth, and offline genome editing is added, transgenic technology is added. So these are the different tools that are available uh, for crop improvement. And using these tools, a lot of progress has been made, but the challenges now are newer challenges have to be addressed with uh, upcoming uh, technologies. To cite one example uh, of two you know, important dwarfing genes, uh, which originated through spontaneous mutation, the norin 10 in case of wheat and DGOUZIN in case of rice. These are the two genes which are uh, often called as green revolution gene, which uh, increased the wheat production, which was uh, merely 12 million tons in the country, is now going to be 111 million tons this year as per projection. The rice million, rice uh, production was about 50 million tons, which has increased to 121 million tons. And this is the power of the technology, the gene, the role that they can play by bringing dwarfiness, dwarfness by uh, bringing uh, fertilizer huge efficiency and uh, enhance uh, productivity. So uh, if you look at the global uh, scenario, uh, currently 8.3 billion people in 2014, the population, global population is going to go up to 13.5 billion. Uh, and uh, we have to increase the production uh, accordingly. Uh, they, they, sorry, the, the requirement for food grain is uh, going to be 13.5 billion uh, tons globally. And therefore, uh, you know, the newer technologies have to be uh, used uh, to a great extent. Uh, using some conventional breeding approaches, uh, we made some uh, disruptive innovation. And these disruptive innovations are extremely important. For example, if you look at the traditional varieties of basmati rice, they were pretty tall prone to lodging, and this is large crop that you can see, uh, which uh, results into very, very poor productivity, photo period sensitivity, long duration, and yield hardly up to 0.5 tons per hectare. So uh, we started working on this, and if you see the journey of eight decades of basmati rice improvement, in 1930, basmati 370 had a grain length on cooking about 12 millimeter, which with the newer varieties like 1509 has got to almost uh, 25 millimeter, one inch. So this gives more volume of rice per unit rice cooked and is uh, excellent uh, material. Uh, the newer varieties of basmati rice like uh, 1121, 1509, 1718. And last uh, year we have developed a couple of new varieties 
and these put together, the export earning from Basmati has increased to 34,000 crores annually. Now, these varieties have brought happiness on the uh, faces of uh, millions of Basmati farmers in particular through export uh, earning. Uh, the molecular breeding technology, which provide a special advantage of uh, precision, early selection, and avoiding cumbersome phenotyping is not required. The linkage drag can be minimized, and pyramiding genes with similar phenotypic effect is possible using markers and also shortening breeding cycle. So these are the classical advantages of molecular breeding. And exploiting these advantages, we have been able to uh, make a lot of progress. You see here, last year, I had to visit a field of farmers in Panipur district, village Urlana. And this was a 25 acres of uh, crop grown under variety, our own variety, Pusawasti 1401. This suffered from neck blast. And you can feel that all these panicles have drooped down because the neck blast, uh, the spiracularia or rhizi, attacks the neck of the panicle and panicle breaks. So you can feel the drooping of panicle down. This is not a regular matured crop, but this is a dried crop because of infestation of neck blast. It happened such a large scale, you can imagine the plight of the farmers whose crop suffers like this. And uh, in order to protect the crops, farmers have been using number of fungicides and particularly tricyclazole is one fungicide they use. Uh, European Union has taken a very strong position that if tricyclazole residue is 0 0.01 ppm, which is the detectable level of uh, uh, you know instrument, less than that instrument cannot detect. So even at 0 0.01 ppm, if it is detected, uh, they have returned number of consignment. And therefore, you know, our basmati rice export to European Union has slipped down from 5 lakh tons in 2016 to almost 2.5 lakh tons in uh, 2021. Now, this has been a major challenge. Farmers uh, use tricyclazole to prevent against the blast disease, but this has a repercussion on our export. Uh, we have been working in this area for uh, you know quite some time. And uh, last year, we came out with three varieties. Uh, Usa Basmati 1886, which is improved version of 1401. Usa Basmati 1847, that is improved version of Usa Basmati 1509, and Usa Basmati 1885, which is improved version of Usa Basmati 1121. And in all these three new versions, we have brought in two genes for bacterial blight, XA13 and XA21, and two genes for blast, PI2 and PI54. And because of these four genes now, you are not required to spray any fungicide and antibiotic on this crop. The crop is safe. The farmers save around three to 4,000 rupees per uh, uh, acre, which otherwise they used to spend on the uh, protection of crops against these uh, you know, fungus. So these varieties are going to revive our export of basmati to European Union in particular, and overall in general, and also minimize the cost of cultivation and therefore improve the productivity of uh, profitability of farmers. Yet another uh, breakthrough innovations which we have done, which again I describe as a disruptive innovation, is uh, herbicide tolerant uh, basmati rice varieties. So uh, we know that uh, rice takes about 3000 liters of water per kilogram of rice production when we use rice under transplanted conditions. And uh, this has been a major concern and people have been accusing often that by exporting rice, we are exporting water. Now, if rice production has to sustain, particularly in those areas where water is becoming a, uh, a crisis, uh, the northwestern part of India, Punjab, Haryana, Western UP, where water table has declined substantially from 10 meters uh, uh, to almost 30 meters in a span of 20, 30 years. Uh, it is important that rice cultivation shifts to uh, direct seeded rice. But in DSR, direct seeded rice, we have three major problems the problem of weeds. Then we have a uh, problem of nematodes under dry conditions, nematode becomes uh, a major concern and then also iron deficiency. So uh, because rice is used to take, uh, uh, you know, iron form of ferrous in reduced form, but in DSR it will be in ferric form so that is not absorbed easily so that becomes a major concern. 
Now to address the problem of uh, weeds, we have come out with herbicide tolerant rice varieties and there through mutagenesis, the ALS gene, acetolactate synthase gene was uh, mutated such that uh, these plants carrying mutant allele, they become uh, resistant to herbicide imija thapir. And uh, now we have transferred this gene uh, to two of our basmati rice varieties, Pusa Basmati 1509 and Pusa Basmati 1121. These two varieties have been released and they will be a boon for promoting direct seeded rice cultivation. Simultaneously, uh, these uh, genes are being transferred in other varieties also, non-basmati varieties also. We have started sharing the material with private sector and they want to deploy it in their hybrids, proprietary hybrids, so that hybrids for direct seeded conditions can always develop. So this will save water uh, uh, to a great extent, almost 35% saving of water, 35% less emission of greenhouse gases, uh, and 35% saving of labor. These are three major advantages in direct seeded rice, which will get promoted through this newer technology. Using molecular breeding, we have also brought in new genes for resistance to rust. Uh, one of our variety, HD2967, uh, was uh, very popular, almost grown in 10 million hectares area, but over a period of time, it has become susceptible to rust. Uh, a new gene uh, from Trinicrea uh, uh, has been transferred uh, in uh, you know, 2967 and a new variety, uh, uh, 3406, HD3406 has been developed, which has been released for commercial cultivation this year. Likewise, number of biofortified and uh, products have been developed. Biofortification is uh, important for alleviating hidden hunger. We have a number of approaches which are being used. One is uh, fortification, other is uh, dietary diversification, then medical supplement and crop biofortification. So these are the four approaches for tackling the problem of malnutrition. When we talk of fortification, which is being promoted by the government in a big way, and this is important to address the immediate problem where iron, zinc, and folic acid is being mixed uh, with the rice flour. So the rice, particularly the broken rice during milling, if you get about 25% broken rice, which is converted into flour, and the flour is added with iron and zinc and folic acid, and then this uh, flour is converted into dough and which is subjected to extrusion. And by extrusion machine, you can print the rice grain exactly of the same size and shape uh, of the variety in which you want to mix. So you can have 20% of extruded grains with added iron, zinc, and folic acid, and the rest normal grain of that variety. Uh, this is, of course, important to immediately address the problem of hidden hunger. But uh, uh, in, in case of fortification, the uh, added uh, micronutrients are not part of the food matrix. And therefore, the bioavailability of this is less, uh, which is addressed in case of biofortification, where we incorporate genes that enhance the ability of plant to, in, to absorb more of uh, micronutrients and accumulate in the grain. And this uh, accumulated micronutrients become part of the food matrix, and therefore, bioavailability is uh, uh, really good. Uh, the malnutrition has a major burden on human health. Because of poor health, the work efficiency uh, of people is reduced greatly. And these estimations have been done uh, by IFRI uh, that India loses roughly $12 billion annually uh, because of uh, you know, poor health of the people. Suppose a person suffering from diabetes, suffering from anemia, other malnutrition deficiency when at work cannot work with full efficiency and so on. And this therefore needs to be uh, addressed and uh, uh, working in this area. In maize, we have come out with biofortified hybrid varieties of maize, which have got elevated pro-vitamin A up to 8 ppm. Tryptophan in protein and lysine in protein has also been increased three times as compared to the normal content. So these biofortified varieties can be a good source of food as well as feed. Uh, and through animals, uh, again, addressing the problem of malnutrition. Uh, likewise, a uh, number of anti-nutritional factors which are present in many crops, for example, in case of mustard, we have erucic acid and glucosinolate. Erucic acid is uh, associated with fibrotic myocardium, heart-related diseases, and glucosinolate, which is found in the DRL cake, it inhibits thyroxine. And therefore, the animals which are fed on the cake, 
particularly non-ruminant animals, if they are fed on this, uh, they have a uh, goiter problem. And therefore, the DRL cake of mustard, which is rich in protein, cannot be used as a feed for, uh, you know, piggery, poultry, uh, which are non-ruminant uh, type. So this, uh, both double zero varieties have been developed. And likewise, in case of soya bean, uh, one of the anti-nutritional factor is uh, Tunis trypsin inhibitor uh, gene. And this null lines for this have been developed through marker system breeding. Uh, likewise, uh, the uh, weeny flavor in uh, soya bean is another problem uh, by removing the locks to uh, gene, the uh, uh, lines uh, which are uh, devoid of weeny flavor have been developed. So uh, overall, uh, you know, uh, uh, the last uh, last year, Honorable Prime Minister had released uh, a number of varieties. By now, uh, something like 84 biofortified crop varieties have been released. Uh, across the different crops. And uh, these varieties have been developed through marker sister selection or through conventional breeding, but they have got uh, elevated level of micronutrients. Uh, now coming to another very exciting area, uh, which is uh, a powerful tool for addressing many problems is uh, genome editing, uh, which is uh, a precise mutagenesis tool. And here I would like to go back to the earlier slide I showed you, uh, uh, the power of a spontaneous mutation and two mutants which have revolutionized agriculture globally are Norin 10 and DGO Ujin in wheat and rice respectively. Now these were spontaneous mutations. The problem of spontaneous mutation is that their frequency is very low, 10 to power minus seven to nine, minus nine. And uh, they, are, uh, you know, they are random in nature. So uh, thinking this, that mutation can be used as a great tool for breeding, uh, uh, we know of Herman Muller and uh, Stadler. Uh, they started working on Drosophila and maize respectively to see if uh, mutations can be induced at a higher frequency by mutagenic agent, be it radiations or with chemical mutagenesis. And they were successful in demonstrating in both these organisms that it is possible to induce mutations uh, at a much higher frequency, uh, which is around 10 to the power minus three. So the question is that uh, uh, th this was demonstrated, but is still the two major problems that they are random in nature and still the frequency is not very high remain. And since then, uh, it has been a dream of uh, uh, molecular biologists for mutation uh, breeding scientists uh, that if we can have site-directed mutagenesis. A lot of research was done on certain chemicals which can be uh, powerful in inducing mutations in genes that you desire to. Uh, but uh, this, this could not become so effective until uh, the work of these two ladies, uh, Jennifer and uh, Carpentier, uh, who got Nobel Prize uh, in 2020 for development of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing tool. Now this CRISPR-Cas9 is nothing but site-directed mutagenesis. You have the power to mutate the gene that you want to mutate and without having any adverse effect in the genome elsewhere. So any commercial variety, high yielding variety, which is suffering from one or two defects can be rectified. And this has become an important tool globally. If you see that there are about 231 products have been cleared so far, and in US 168 genome edited uh, product applications have been given non-GM status. The crops which are being addressed uh, are many, as you can see here, rice, tomato, maize, soybean, wheat, potato, canola, barley. In all these cases, the products are available. And uh, the traits that are being addressed include agronomic value, date, food and feed quality, biotic, abiotic, stress, herbicide tolerance, and response to food. In India also, a lot of uh, intensive work is being done on genome uh, editing. Some of the uh, classical examples which are available globally is uh, high folic acid uh, soybean, which uh, is already available in the market. Then uh, GABA is tomato. And we know that uh, uh, gamma uh, amino butyric acid, it reduces blood pressure and also is associated with uh, neuron functions. And uh, a glutamate decarboxylase uh, enzyme that uh, converts uh, glutamic acid into GABA. And if editing is done in this gene, it increases the GAD activity. 
and using this editing, uh, uh, the lines of tomato have been developed and commercialized, which have got almost 15 fold higher lava uh, content as compared to normal tomatoes. Likewise, in uh, fishes, genome editing has been done, for example, in tiger buffer. The leptin receptor gene, which controls appetite, is knocked down, uh, causing fish to eat more, and edited fish grow 1.9 times heavier in the same time. Uh, another uh, mutation through genome editing in Red Sea Bream has been done, where uh, myostatin protein has been uh, altered, and this protein suppresses muscle growth, is knocked out, and edited fish grow 1.2 times larger on the same amount of food. So genome editing has become a powerful tool to address many of these problems, and Government of India has been quite uh, supportive of this technology. Uh, and uh, has come out with guidelines for safety assessment of genome edited plants and standard operating procedures for regulatory review of genome edited plants under SDN1 and SDN2. These are the two categories where we are not bringing any gene from outside. We are only trying to alter the gene which is present in the plant. Uh, the gene that has uh, a protein of known safe history for many, many years, and therefore the biosafety requirements are not there. Uh, in these cases, and they have been exempted as per Indian legislation as SDN1 and SDN2 product. However, SDN3 is still remains in the category of uh, GM, and uh, SDN3 is uh, like uh, uh, you are altering, you can bring a gene, but still you can bring through genome editing, you can have localization of gene to the place where you want, and that way it has got great advantage over the conventional transgenic approaches. At IRI, our colleague Dr. Vishnathan is working on editing of uh, uh, genome editing of variety MTU 1010, where a uh, number of edits have been developed, which under drought stress and uh, salt stress. The gene that has been edited is the drought and salt tolerant gene, DST. And you can see under stress the kind of difference that you see in productivity of these varieties, almost 6 to 70% higher yield under stress condition is observed. There are concern in using this technology and uh, Dr. Sasne is there. We had a meeting very recently to address these issues. And as you know that the technology was first developed by Jennifer and Carpentier. And uh, uh, from there, uh, they jointly find, file a patent in European Union. Uh, first, they demonstrated it in bacterial prokaryotic system. And they got a US patent on this. But later uh, at Broad Institute, MIT, Fang Zhang has come out with the demonstration of genome editing in eukaryotic system. And when the applications were filed in uh, US, USPTA, uh, the priority date goes to uh, uh, Broad Institutes. And therefore there is a conflict happening between these two as to who should get the patent right. Uh, Corteva on the other hand has negotiated with both these institutes and has got the uh, right uh, for licensing of the technology. Uh, this requires two kinds of license. One is research license. Anybody who is working on genome editing has to have a research license. Without research license, you cannot do genome editing. Unfortunately, in our country, all the labs that are doing genome editing today, they are doing without having research license. Second is a commercialization license. And for that, terms, conditions needs to be negotiated. And uh, since government of India is uh, supporting a major project on genome editing, almost 500 crores uh, have been announced in the new budget. And uh, this uh, also along with that Department of Biotechnology and CSIR, all three institutions ICR are having a joint committee chaired by cabinet secretary. So we are working in this direction, how to negotiate on this and bilateral negotiation with Parteva is on. Also, freedom to operate license uh, mediated by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We are trying our intergovernmental negotiations. While research will go, in the meantime, IP has to be addressed. But most importantly, it is very important that now we should invest sufficient time in research on developing our own IP related to genome editing. Uh, one classical example is that, you know, Barnage Bar Star System, when it came in 1991 by Mariani et al. Uh, it got a U.S. patent, but later on, Professor Deepak Quintal Group was able to substantially and uh, 
modify this technology and they had their own barnage bar star system with a US patent. So something of that sort has to be done by researchers in the country also so that we are not, uh, we are free from the clutches of intellectual property rights. Otherwise it would be difficult to progress in this area. Spread breeding is another innovation which was done by Australian scientist Lee Hickey. And uh, this allows you to grow as many as six crops in a year. Using off-season facility and conventional breeding program, we have been able to get two crops or maximum three crops. And our predecessors were very wise in initiating off-season nursery for each crop. For example, at IRI, uh, for rice, we have Arutrai down south. For wheat, we have Wellington again. Uh, and also in uh, Lahol Spiti for uh, maize and for darwar for pulses. So these oxygen nursery were allowed and established in order to take two crops at least in a year. But a speed breeding facility provides six to seven crops in a year. And so one such uh, very good facility, uh, a speed breed has been developed at ISAR Varanasi. This is uh, International Rice Research Institute Regional Center. Uh, and uh, this has come up, this facility where we can have about four to five crops rice in a year. Uh, the facility has its great advantage, uh, but of course uh, it's expensive facility and to maintain because electricity cost, et cetera, is high, particularly in the climatic conditions which have uh, major extremes from four degree to 45 degree. But a speed building facility in places like Hyderabad and uh, Bangalore would be really situations to uh, expedite the entire process. Uh, GM crop for sustainable food production system, although you keep hearing a lot of opposition now and then, uh, but the kind of transformation uh, and the life-changing advances which were made by the GM crop, particularly BT. Uh, as we know, uh, the India, we grow about 12 million hectares area under BT cotton, and it is all BT cotton 100%, and that's a help in reducing the pesticide use, enhancing productivity, of course, problems of uh, other pests uh, like pink ball worm has come and then white fly has come, but that has nothing to do with, uh, you know, not because of this BT technology, these pests have come, they have come otherwise. They can also be addressed by the technology. Uh, this is still relevant, the transgenic technology and SDN3 is still relevant because genome editing can be carried out only for those genes which are native to plants. But if you want to bring a bacterial gene, it has to come from bacteria and the transgenic is the only route. Their genome editing cannot help. So I think uh, this is again a very powerful tool and as and when it is necessary, it should be uh, used and with equal emphasis given to this. Now shifting the gear from the genetic uh, innovations, uh, I will uh, now talk about climate change and regenerative agriculture, which is again a very important uh, area and a lot of development globally. Uh, taking place. I hope I'm not running out of time. Uh, have some time to go maybe another 15 minutes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, please continue. So uh, the climate change uh, is one of the major concern uh, globally. And in India from agriculture, we have about 4.8 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gas emission that happens. Under Paris Agreement, uh, India has given a uh, commitment that uh, the intensity has to be reduced by 30, 35% by 2030 at the base level of 2005. In COP26, Honorable Prime Minister has taken a pledge uh, to get a net zero uh, emission by 2070. Uh, so uh, there is a need to reduce uh, greenhouse gases from agriculture as well. Although if we look at the per capita, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission uh, is, is still much lower in India as compared to countries like China, US and United uh, Un uh, European Union. So uh, the, how do we do this? And uh, we all know that uh, carbon is the basis of life. Life starts from carbon. You talk of DNA basis, they have carbon, sugar has carbon, and without carbon, there is no life. Now, how we can preserve carbon? What is the major pool of carbon, uh, reservoir of carbon 
uh, that is soil. If you talk of agricultural land, this is the biggest reservoir of the carbon where carbon sequestration can be done. How it can be done in this context, we are partnering with one uh, you know, industry called uh, Grow Indigo. And Grow Indigo is a joint venture between an American company Indigo and uh, Indian company Mahiko. They have uh, initiated this joint venture and IRA has got a partnership with them to uh, do uh, you know, research in the area of carbon credit, carbon farming and carbon trading. How this can help farmers, uh, you know, uh, and how farmers can be incentivized if they go for using regenerative agricultural practices. So, uh, if you see the farmland supply side, soil is the natural carbon sink. Over one third of the land mass is covered with agricultural soil, and farmers can sequester more carbon in soil by adopting regenerative agricultural practices. What are those regenerative agricultural practices? I will come little later. And from the corporate side, the corporates are increasingly looking for ways to offset their emission. So the corporate, in the sense, you talk of uh, uh, aviation industry, which is flying aeroplane. It has to burn fuel. Food and beverage industry, it has its own footprint. Take, for example, KFC and the uh, amount of chicken that it consumes uh, in the restaurant and the power production of those chicken, if you calculate backward, how much emission happens and so on and so forth. So every industry has got its carbon footprint on the environment. The industry now have to get green rating. Now, if they can't reduce their footprint of carbon, they have been given an option that they can buy the carbon credit from other sources, wherever it is available by paying money. Now, here comes an opportunity if farmers can generate carbon credit from agriculture, and that carbon credit is paid by the industry the farmers would get money for using, and how they will get carbon credit is by using regenerative agricultural practices. Now, for example, if we take uh, uh, pollution that is caused by uh, burning paddy straw, it's huge. Now, if we can uh, accurately test model productivity impact of burning straw versus retaining crop stubbles with atlas, Degrade crop residue with certain microbiomes like at IRI, we have developed USA decomposer and incorporate in the soil, it helps in carbon sequestration. Overuse of fertilizers and other input. As we know that farmers go on using as much as four bags of urea in one acre of rice and without realizing whether it is going to really help or not. And then the effect on pollution that it has, how this can be minimized by bringing, uh, enhancing the nitrogen use efficiency by uh, you know, uh, bringing microbial consortia into action and so on and so forth. And then when farmers shift to these practices, uh, they have to be incentivized in terms of monetary gain. Now, uh, these are the practices which uh, I would like to mention here that uh, at IRI, as I said, uh, we have joined hand with Grow Indigo to promote regenerative agricultural practices like residue incorporation, direct seed to rice, conservation agriculture, laser leveling, alternative cropping pattern, micro irrigation, use of biologicals. These are several practices and many more which are classified as regenerative agricultural practices. And these help reduce environmental pollution. These help enrich carbon, uh, carbon sequestration in the soil and therefore improve the soil health. Now, if a farmer is using all these regenerative agricultural practices, he can earn up to five to eight carbon credit per hectare. And one carbon credit is equal to one tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And one carbon credit, the global price is currently 37 to 40 US dollar, a good carbon credit. And therefore approximately 15,000 rupees per hectare can be given to farmers if a farmer is going for residue incorporation rather than burning, if he's going for direct seeded rice in place of transplanting of rice, if he's going for conservation agriculture like zero till wheat in place of uh, conventional uh, tilling, laser leveling, and so on and so forth. So there is a huge opportunity, and it is estimated that the carbon export from Indian agriculture is going to surpass the value of export that is earned by rice and wheat. 
And to tell you, rice, we have got about $8 billion of export, $5 billion comes from Basmati, rest $3 billion from non Basmati. Wheat export last year was 10,000 crores. But the potential of carbon export from agriculture is huge, and there are so many buyers available. Now, doing this experiment with uh, Grow Indigo, uh, this you can see, for example, when paddy is harvested with combined uh, and people go for burning. Uh, if you use uh, super Caesar, happy Caesar, that adds to a uh, practice. So here for rice, wheat, and maize cropping system, a projection is given by a Grow Indigo company that uh, uh, from 1.7 million hectare area, we brought under the regenerative agricultural practices from 2023 starting to 2027. This will generate these many carbon credits. And the value of this carbon credit from 1.7 million hectare in 2027 will be 1,000 crores. Just from 1.7 million hectare, uh, wheat is grown in uh, uh, Punjab about 3.4 million hectare. So from 1.7 million hectare, the, the value is 1,000 crore. And this is going to grow further. This is the projection from one company. Many other companies are coming forward in this field. Educating people about uh, this and therefore carbon uh, kacha has been started by these companies and we are helping these why carbon is good for health why farmers should worry about it and so on and so forth uh, how it improves the soil health and then also iri is helping them for validation for example if on platform the farmers have to register in the carbon credit program now if i'm a farmer and i'm registering in the carbon credit program uh, that I am doing uh, direct seeded rice in my field, uh, I am doing laser leveling in my field, I am doing zero till in my field, and so on and so forth. How does the company know that whether it is being done by farmers or not? And that exercise we have done by remote uh, uh, satellite uh, uh, you know, assessment, the data from seven satellites uh, available, and that data at our ground stations in IRI, uh, using satellite data, and also ground truthing, we have done sending people to those locations because when a farmer is registering the program, farmers will give the longitude, latitude of his field, field. And at that field, we can go through satellite and see whether there is direct seeding done there or transplanting done there. And then we have done physical verification by ground truthing. And uh, from 10,000 hectare verification, we have found the uh, association R square is 0.9. So that's a very high correlation. That means now a company need not to worry about whether claims being made are right or, uh, uh, or not. So we know that there is a way by which it can be checked. So that we have done. Also, we have done for tillage validation. We have done for direct seeded rice uh, validation. And uh, this will continue uh, further. Honorable Prime Minister uh, has at COP26 mentioned that today there is a need for all of us to come together and take lifestyle for environment. So life uh, campaign uh, has been started and this can become a mass movement for environmentally conscious lifestyle, uh, you know, which is extremely important. Uh, this, uh, there is uh, also, this is to be linked with the environmental, social and governance uh, with respect to corporate sector. Uh, reducing the emission, green credit program, goodwill in the market for pro-planet collaborator. And uh, on the other side, from market opportunities, increasing demand for low carbon goods, environmentally conscious purchase, and product differentiation. So now, for example, when uh, comes November or October end, uh, there is a burning of paddy straw in Punjab and Haryana and Western UP. And the pollution comes to Delhi. Everybody starts making hue and cry. Now, as a citizen, everybody is in trouble. but if you are provided a clean air to breathe, that the farmers do not burn paddy straw, how are you going to contribute to this? Is also a social responsibility of every individual citizen. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the program which is initiated is, for example, low carbon rice. And the first batch of low carbon rice has been procured for sampling. And low carbon rice, uh, for example, is a rice that is produced using all regenerative agricultural practices which have 
reduced impact on greenhouse generation. Now, if there is a brand of low carbon rice as a consumer and as a responsible citizen uh, to take advantage of good environment, uh, we need to pay more so that farmers get money and farmers does what you want. So now uh, this uh, program has been initiated and uh, the low carbon rice packaging uh, are going to come in the market very soon. And this will come from a uh, guided and monitored cultivation procured from carbon program of farmers because farmers are registered to pay these procured from their field. It is processed, monitored by expert, branding claims is backed by science, and then it is uh, packed as per consumer's demand. And therefore, uh, the, uh, there is a premium associated as far as payment is concerned per kilogram of rice. And uh, this also contributes to social responsibility of every citizen and farmers get more money from this. Now coming to another very important area, and that's uh, you know application of uh, remote sensing, particularly use of drone in agriculture. When we talk of drone application in agriculture, general perception is that drone can be used for spraying insecticide, pesticide, fungicide, and so on. But other than that, there are several applications of drone. For example, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, you know uh, imaging using drone uh, sensors, the camera which are uh, having a multispectra and hyperspectral imaging system in a crop field. Uh, for example, the, the picture that you see on right hand here, we had uh, a large number of uh, you know, varieties grown at different levels of nitrogen. And through drone imaging, some plots are subjected to low nitrogen, some to high nitrogen. By imaging, you can see the crop performance clearly in the field. Likewise, if you have uh, infestation of a particular insect, for example, brown plant hopper in rice, just flying drone over say 100 acres, you can pinpoint at which location the insect establishment has happened. And this can be done by sensors. There are biosensors which can also sense the emissions from the insect and so on. And once we know the area which is affected by insect or disease, then next time when drone goes for spraying the chemicals, uh, in the memory of drone, this data is fed. And therefore, it will go and spray at that location only, not in the entire field. And therefore, you reduce the insecticide use or pesticide use, you control insect very effectively, and therefore you prevent the losses happening from the rest of the field. And at the same time, you prevent the, uh, what is called uh, pesticide residue coming because you're not spraying uh, excessively. Likewise, drones can be used for generating uh, soil health card. Now, this is one area where we are working uh, you know, uh, uh, to have, uh, because we know that government of India has got a soil health uh, card generation program, uh, but the requirement in terms of uh, wet lab chemistry, uh, the number of parts which are to be generated are too many, it's very difficult to meet that requirement. And therefore, having a satellite uh, imagery based on hyperspectral signatures and multispectral signatures from the satellites and the wet lab chemistry from the same field, uh, we have established correlation with respect to different uh, nutrient uh, parameters, uh, which is about 0.7 uh, coming, that's pretty good. And if this becomes possible, then generating soil health card, not at a base level of 2.5 hectare for uh, you know, uh, irrigated areas, four hectare for dry land areas, uh, which is not any way reflective of individual farms soil health card. It will be possible to generate multiple soil health card for even a single farmers uh, for a piece of land so that site specific nutrient management can be a real application in precision agriculture. Uh, because uh, for four hectare, if we have one soil health card, it doesn't mean anything in terms of application of uh, nutrients uh, to link it with the site specific nutrient application program in precision agriculture. So this is one area that we are working which uh, will have a uh, long uh, term implications in terms of generating soil health card. Of course, uh, Internet of Things for Precision Agriculture, particularly Dr. Uh, Suman Preet mentioned about protected cultivation, monitoring soil, moisture, and water in tomato crops in protected cultivation. Internet of Things enable automated irrigation system 
Uh, these are the uh, things which are extremely important and that will be essentially required for precision agriculture uh, to progress. Coming to uh, microbiome, power of microbiome, and this is one area where Professor Sushil Kumar uh, has uh, you know, worked uh, throughout his uh, career, uh, particularly on Associa coli, on Azetobacter, and also initiating work on host symbiont mutagenesis to identify better combinations of uh, you know, host and symbiont, which can help in fixing the uh, uh, nitrogen in particular. Uh, in the uh, roots of the plants. Now, we know that uh, host plant fitness, health, and productivity depends on diversity of microbial network. And uh, developing and commercializing microbial product based on the new knowledge and information of microbiome is extremely important. The nitrogen fixing bioinoculant share is 79% with a value of US dollar 1.5 billion, which is likely to double by 2024. Uh, uh, if you see the micro, uh, microbes uh, for use in agriculture has been there for pretty long. The U.S. company started uh, nitrogen in 1900. In uh, IRI, we had several PUSA microbial inoculant developed as early as 1960. But unfortunately, this has not become integral part of our agriculture system, primarily for the region that there is no quality assurance. There is no storability, uh, uh, storage issues, another problem, availability at the site. Many of the companies which are into manufacturing microbiome or microbiological based uh, uh, product uh, are spurious in nature. Uh, big companies have not come in this so that quality assurance is there. Now, this is one area where we have to really uh, work. And as I said, that the total market of uh, uh, you know, biostimulant today. Uh, is globally about 2.24 billion, uh, which is likely to increase in 2026 by 5.69 uh, billion. So there is huge potential in this area, and uh, there are a uh, number of uh, you know uh, what is called uh, opportunities: bioethanol production from crop residue and their uh, Saccharomyces trichoderma, uh, and a number of other organisms, cyanobacteria. Uh, have been identified with potential to uh, produce bioethanol uh, from the raw material crop residue. And now from paddy strain, in fact, a lot of uh, uh, German companies have come in Punjab. Uh, big plants for bioethanol productions are being established uh, with a capacity of uh, almost uh, two, three lakh tons of consumption of paddy straw per day. And that they are supported by uh, micro uh, biological tools for uh, better and faster uh, decomposition process. So this is another potential area where we need to uh, you know, explore. The plastic eating bacteria, uh, we have heard a lot uh, about the uh, oil spillage control to bacteria. Uh, the work of Anand Chakravarti, which was highlighted a lot during 1983 Genetics Congress in India. But later on, Terry, Dr. Banwari Lal has done you know, uh, uh, use the number of cultures uh, uh, that helps in the oil industry uh, for uh, uh, better recovery of uh, uh, oils from the mining wells. And uh, they, they are making big money out of that. Uh, so plastic eating bacteria, again, has got, uh, this is University of Edinburgh, has used uh, E. coli to convert plastic into uh, vanillin, which is a primary component of uh, vanilla. So uh, these are the new opportunities. Likewise, uh, microbial insecticides, uh, Bavaria, uh, Metarhizum, Bacillus. Uh, these are available at IRI, and they have got uh, antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral, anti nematode properties, and also against insect uh, quite effective. They need to be promoted. And this uh, is future of agriculture. Also, if you look at the government priorities, there is a lot of focus on reducing the chemicals used in agriculture, uh, I think uh, these potential molecules would become extremely important. The RNAi-based nano-pesticides, uh, where delivery of RNA, whether it is double standard RNA or microRNA or NTCS oligos, and these molecules are coated with uh, biodegradable nanoparticles. Uh, these are low cost uh, inventions, highly specific and be sprayed like pesticide. Uh, they are not uh, pollutant. 
and no residual effect on water and uh, environment. So this, this will become extremely important. Uh, there are translational research we have initiated with Australian lab uh, in IRI. Uh, again, uh, slow release moisture capsule uh, at IRI, we developed uh, you know, USA hydrogel, and there are other uh, capsules which are available, which can be uh, uh, placed the two to three capsules in the root zone and help in releasing moisture at a very slow rate as and when the crop requires so there is no uh, uh, rain off loss and uh, uh, less evaporation loss uh, that happens. So uh, I, I think to sum up a uh, few areas that are left like uh, uh, cellular agriculture, Dr. Uh, Kanuja mentioned, because of time limit, I'm not able to uh, cover that, which again has uh, you know, great uh, opportunities. But what is important is that to uh, use these innovations in agriculture, uh, cutting edge science and technology, the investment uh, on human resource development and infrastructure uh, and innovation is extremely important. Uh, and at least 1.4% of agricultural GDP should be put to agricultural research. Currently, we are around 0.4%. Many countries have gone to 1%, 1.2%, 1.4%. Ours is still 0.4%, which is less. The government is trying hard to increase the investment in agricultural research and development as a proportion of agricultural GDP. Newer technologies, technologies are going to be in driving seed, whether it is artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, big data, robotics, internet of things, and blockchain technology climate is smart, regenerative and remunerative agriculture, and then forward farms. Uh, so this is about uh, adoption of management technologies considering the small farm holding, establishing many companies are coming forward to establish these farms in the rural areas uh, as a demonstration farms where all innovations can be put together on the farmer's field so that people can come and see and believe that yes, this works. Then addressing uh, hidden hunger by many streaming biofortified crops, and uh, focusing on nutritional literacy. Now, uh, we know that we are celebrating International Year of Millet 2023. Uh, an international conference was organized recently at IRI. Uh, and Prime Minister inaugurated that. The kind of awareness that has been generated about millets and their use in the nutrition is phenomenal. Uh, the interest of people have got revised, people had forgotten. Uh, so this is again very important and meeting the sustainable development goal because 12 of 17 sustainable development goals are directly or indirectly related to agriculture. And therefore, uh, to meet the requirements, it is important that agriculture should get focused. And uh, uh, one health approach, uh, we discussed about soil and what is one health approach? Uh, if uh, our soil is healthy, then plants that grow on soil, they will be healthy. If plants have better nutrition accumulated in the grains, we consume those grains, we will be healthy. The plants are also used as a feed by animals. And if plants are healthy, animal will be healthy. And through animal, we get meat, we get milk, we get several other products uh, for human. So uh, if those are healthy, we will be healthy. So actually the health of human, the health of plant, health of animal, and health of environment all depends on health of soil. And therefore, let us place that we make our soil healthy, make our soil rich in microbiome, rich in micro uh, uh, biological organisms, number of them which have depleted because of intensive uh, chemical agriculture. I think there is important uh, uh, need for this, and this will be a great tribute to Professor Sushil Kumar, who lived all his life for agriculture and with a major focus on uh, microbiome and microbiological research. Thank you very much, uh, Flora and Fauna, for giving me this uh, opportunity. And it has been a pleasure interacting with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. So we witnessed how with major interventions, we as a country shifted from importing to exporting nation and food production became more resilient over the years. Thank you, sir, for shedding light on technological innovations for future farming, where we understood the importance of molecular breeding, <clears throat> crop biofortification, transgenics, precision agriculture, regenerative agriculture, and more with a lot of examples with a wide array of examples. 
So now at this juncture, I would request Professor Espes Kanuja to sum up and tell the key messages in Hindi so that uh, the farmers listening to us today uh, would get benefited from this. Thank you, Manika. Thank you, Professor Ashok Singh. Uh, uh, it's uh, really always a delight to listen to you uh, when it comes to a visionary aspect of the subjects in agriculture. And that's why I felt and our all members felt that if you give the oration on this very important topic, it's going to serve a great purpose. Uh, I'm so happy that you used the future canvas and painted uh, a, a picture of agriculture, how it is going to look beyond 2047 or mid-50s uh, of uh, this century. And uh, definitely your uh, deliberation and your presentation uh, will help uh, many researchers and also entrepreneurs to think beyond what they are doing. And uh, as uh, Manika said, we have also many uh, entrepreneurs who would like us uh, to uh, describe to them what you said uh, in our uh, uh, national language, Hindi, Matra Bhasha Hindi. So I'll try to summarize, although I might uh, miss some of the points, which perhaps if you would like, you can uh, point out also. So Professor Singh uh, in this oration started with the uh, a dilemma of uh, food versus population and uh, described that how various kinds of revolutions in agriculture, right from green to yellow to brown to gray to blue and so on happened and why they were named so and what quantum jump it was able to produce with the existing technologies. And from there, he also uh, came to uh, 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 Basmati. So this thing, if I explain to our entrepreneurs, uh, Dr. Singh ne ye bataya hume ke jo uh, bhojan hai, jo ahar hai, wo humari ek avashakta hai, aur krishi usko kis tarike se poon kar sakti hai, aur us krishi dwara kaise pradyogi ki, usme ek bohut bada antar la sakti hai. To unho ne bataya ke kis tarike se harit kranti ne ek aisi uh, sthiti paida ki, jisme हम मांगने वाले ना होकर आ, लोगों को आहार या भोजन या खाद्यान्न प्रदार्थ दे सके तो इंपोर्ट से एक्सपोर्ट तक हम पहुंच सके और उसमें पूरा देश देश की राजनीति और देश के वैज्ञानिक और देश के किसान सभी ने मिलकर आ, काम किया तो हम वहां पहुंचे और वहां से जब हम गुणवत्ता की ओर बढ़े और ऐसी आ, कुछ आ, फसलों की ओर जो बहुत अच्छा एक तो एक तरफ तो उसको रूप दे सकती है दूसरी तरफ एक्सपोर्ट वैल्यू और अधिक बढ़ा सकती है इसमें एक व्याख्यान पहले भी डॉक्टर सिंह ने दिया था बासमती चावल पर कर किस तरीके से ये एक मोती है जो कि खुशबू भी देता है और आपको लक्ष्मी भी प्रदान करता है तो उसमें किस किस तरीके से ना केवल खुशबू तक हम रहे उस फसल को किस तरीके से हम आ, पानी जो एक बहुत बड़ा आ, रिसोर्स है जिसमें अब कमी होनी दिखाई देनी शुरू हो चुकी है और आ, उसको हम उसके लिए ज्यादा अच्छा बना सकते हैं कम पानी में ज्यादा फसल उगा सकते हैं और उससे आगे बढ़े जो बीस सौ इक्कीस में प्रधानमंत्री द्वारा बायो फोर्टिफाइड क्रॉप जो कि आपको याद है आ, जो फ्लोरा फोना का एक पूरे वर्ष का थीम रहा है पोषण से रोशन वो उसी में ही समा जाता है कि किस तरीके से कुछ इस तरीके की फसलें हो सकती है जिनमें हम कृषि द्वारा कृषि की रिसर्च द्वारा या अनुसंधान द्वारा उनमें वो वाले गुण ला सकते हैं वो पोषण पोष पौष्टिक चीजें ला सकते हैं जिससे न केवल हम अपनी भूख मिटाएंगे बल्कि हम अपने एक स्वास्थ्य के लिए भी उनका उपयोग कर सकते हैं और उसी का एक स्वरूप निकल के आया है जो इंटरनेशनल ईयर ऑफ मिलेट्स बीस सौ तेईस बनने जा रहा है कि मिलेट्स का उपयोग भी हम करें और मिलेट्स में आगे रिसर्च भी हो अनुसंधान भी हो जिससे हम उसको और अच्छे रूप दे सके और जो एक आजकल विश्व स्तर पर बात की जाती है सुपर फूड्स की वो मिलेट्स और एक एंशियंट ग्रेन्स या सीरियल्स इन सब के कॉम्बिनेशन से बन सकती है 
वहां से आगे बढ़ते हुए डॉक्टर सिंह ने आपको बताया कि कौन सी आधुनिक प्रौद्योगिकियां हैं जो कि जेनेटिकली मॉडिफाइड तक ही सीमित ना रहकर उसका भी एक एक सॉल्यूशन लेकर आई है वो है जीनोम एडिटिंग या जिसको हम साइड डायरेक्टेड म्यूटाजेनेसिस का नया रूप कह सकते हैं जिसके द्वारा आप जो पर्टिकुलर या स्पेसिफिक जो गुण है जिसको आप चाहते हैं उसमें अच्छा हो उसमें म्यूटेशन करके उसको बढ़िया बना सकते हैं तो उसमें करते करते जो क्रिस्प क्रिस्पर कैश टेक्नोलॉजी निकल के आई उसमें नोबेल प्राइज भी मिला है लेकिन आई में या हमारे आई में जिस तरीके से रिसर्च हो रही है तो इसका उपयोग हमें बढ़ता हुआ मिलेगा और उन्होंने कुछ फसलों के उदाहरण भी दिए जिसमें ये हो सका है उससे आगे बढ़ते हुए डॉक्टर सिंह ने आपको स्पीड फार्मिंग जिसमें गति प्रदान हो सके स्पीड ब्रीडिंग कैसे हो सकती है तो उसमें मोलिकुलर ब्रीडिंग और इस तरीके के मार्कर्स द्वारा जिससे हम और जल्दी वेराइटी की उत्पत्ति की ओर बढ़ सकते हैं आपको बताया साथ में उन्होंने जीएम के बारे में भी बताया कि जेनेटिकली मॉडिफाइड एक हवा तो बनाया गया है लेकिन ये ऐसा नहीं है ये हमारे आवश्यकता है और समय के अनुसार हम जब आगे बढ़ते जाएंगे तो ऐसी फसलें जरूर आएंगी जिनको हम उपयोग करेंगे फिर जब हम क्लाइमेट की बात करते हैं जो मैंने शुरू में भी बात करी थी कि आजकल एग्रीकल्चर को लोग दोषी मानने लग गए कि क्लाइमेट को भी एग्रीकल्चर उल्टा रहा है ऐसा नहीं है कुछ ऐसे छुटपुट उदाहरण है जहाँ पराली जलाए जाना या इस तरीके की चीजें तो होती है लेकिन जो क्लाइमेट को उपयोग और उसमें जो उसका सुधार कर सकते हैं उसके लिए क्या हो सकता है जो क्या होता है जिसको हम रीजेनरेटिव एग्रीकल्चर कहते हैं या पुनर्जीवा कृषि कहेंगे जिसमें हम उसी कृषि के जो उत्पाद है एक तरफ तो हम फसल ले जाते हैं और फसल से हम उसका उपयोग चाहे भोजन की तरफ लेके जाएं या किसी और उपयोग में लेके आए जो बाकी का उसका अंश बच जाता है उसका भी उपयोग कैसे कर सकते हैं बजाय इसके कि उसको केवल हम जलाएं इस तरीके की प्रौद्योगिकियों की ओर हम बढ़ सकते हैं और उसको ही आगे लिंक करते हुए हम जो माइक्रोबायोम है जो कि बहुत बड़ी एक शक्ति होगी आपको याद होगा फ्लोरा होना हमेशा इस बात की बात करता है कि जो अदृश्य बायोडाइवर्सिटी है जब अविविधता है उसकी ओर जरूर ध्यान दिया जाए और एक आंकड़ा जो मैंने अभी तक पढ़ाई से समझा है और सीखा है वो ये कहता है कि 10 प्रतिशत वो लोग हैं जो वो प्राणी हैं जो आपको दिखते हैं और 90 प्रतिशत वो हैं जो नहीं दिखते हैं तो वो माइक्रोबायोम है वो जमीन में अपनी मृदा में सॉयल में भी होता है वो पौधे में भी होता है हमारे अंदर भी होता है हम उसको अलग अलग टर्मिनोलॉजी के रूप में आ, समझते हैं तो डॉक्टर सिंह ने आपको बताया कि उस माइक्रोबायोम द्वारा कैसे आप सुधार ला सकते हैं आ, एक तरफ जो सॉइल है जो मृदा है मिट्टी की जो उर्वरकता है उसको बढ़ा सकते हैं दूसरी तरफ जो पौधे हैं उनमें कीट नाशक या इस तरीके की दवाइयां ना डालनी पड़े वो भी माइक्रोब्स या जीवाणु जो है उनका उपयोग से हम आ, कर सकते हैं और जो मैं सेलुलर एग्रीकल्चर की बात कर रहा था वो भी माइक्रोब्स में ही जाके टिकेगा क्योंकि आ, मैं समझता हूं कि जो कृषि है कृषि का जो आगे उपयोग होने जा रहा है जिसमें हम लैंडलेस प्लांटलेस एग्रीकल्चर की भी बात कर सकते हैं वो उसके मेटाबॉलिज्म में है और मेटाबॉलिज्म जो है जैसा मैंने कहा नब्बे प्रतिशत माइक्रोब है तो इसलिए जो हम जब प्रिसीजन एग्रीकल्चर के साथ प्रिसीजन फर्मेंटेशन की ओर बढ़ेंगे तो आपको सोलर प्रोटीन और इस तरीके के उत्पाद भी नजर आएंगे जो कि वही होंगे जो पौधों से पैदा होते हैं और कैप्टिव कल्टीवेशन या कैप्टिव कल्टीवेशन से भी अधिक जो प्रिसीजन लेबोरेटरी के स्तर पर आप चीजें कर सकते हैं वो लेबोरेटरी कृषक के पास होगी वो कृषक की लेबोरेटरी होगी जिसमें वो इस तरीके के भोजन और इस तरीके के मोलिक्यूल या इस तरीके के उत्पाद बना सकेगा तो इन चीजों को कवर करते हुए आज डॉक्टर अशोक कुमार सिंह ने हमें एक ऐसी यात्रा करवाई जिससे हमें समझ में आ सकता है कि सन 1906 से लेकर अब बीस तक डेढ़ सौ वर्ष जो हैं उसमें क्या क्या चेंजेस आ रहे हैं क्या बदलाव आ रहे हैं और क्या बदलाव आने चाहिए और क्या आने की संभावना है 
तो आ, मेरा ये मानना है कि इसके आ, इसको अगर हम एक इस तरीके से देखें कि ये एक रूपरेखा है जो आ, पूरा हमारा जो प्लेनेट है जो हमारी धरती है उसको हम अगर बचाने की कोशिश करना चाहते हैं तो उसका जो आ, सारांश है वो मिट्टी में है वो सॉयल में है सॉयल को हम डॉक्टर सिंह ने कहा कि हेल्दी आ, अगर रखेंगे तो फिर दूसरी चेन उन्होंने बताई कि किस तरीके से वो हेल्थ आप तक पहुंचती है वो सारे प्राणियों की हेल्थ है वो सारे पौधों की है वो सभी सूक्ष्म जीवियों की है और इसलिए हमें एक और सोच लानी होगी कि जो मिट्टी है वो जीवित है अगर हम मिट्टी को मार देंगे तो फिर मिट्टी एक केमिकल बन जाएगी तो बजाय ऑर्गेनिक और केमिकल फार्मिंग और इस तरीके की टर्म्स करने के बजाय अगर अब हम कहें कि जीवित कृषि करनी है जिसमें मिट्टी को या सॉयल को जीवित रखेंगे और वो समझेंगे कि वो जीवित कैसे है जिसमें माइक्रोबायोम है जो जड़ों के आसपास है राइजोस्फियर उसको बोलते हैं जो जड़ों के दूर है उसको फ्री लिविंग बोलते हैं और जो उसी जड़ उसी मिट्टी से पौधे के ऊपर आ जाता है जिसको फिलोस्फियर या फिलोप्लेन और कई टर्म्स में बताया जाता है यही वो मेटाबॉलिक प्रोसेसेस हैं जिससे कृषि एक नया रूप ले लेगी हम अगर सूक्ष्म जीवियों से सीखते हुए पौधों तक ले जाएंगे और पौधों से अपने तक ले आएंगे तो यही भविष्य है हमारे कृषि का जो प्लेनेट के सर्वाइवल के लिए हमारे प्लेनेट या हमारी धरती को बचाने के लिए बहुत ही आवश्यक है तो इस आ, 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 मेरी आशा है कि मैंने इस पूरी जो डॉक्टर सिंह ने बात कही उसको थोड़ा बहुत वहां तक पहुंचाया है हिंदी में हमारे एंटरप्रेन्योर्स और किसानों तक भी तो डॉक्टर सिंह अगर आप कुछ इसमें ऐड करना चाहें कुछ और जोड़ना चाहें तो जरूर कहें नहीं सर कुछ नहीं बचा आपने बहुत अच्छी तरह से सब समराइज किया है लगता हमारे साथ डॉक्टर साथ भी आए हुए हैं और डॉक्टर अजीत शासनी भी हैं दोनों ही हमारे गेस्ट ऑफ ऑनर है मैं उनसे कहूंगा कि अगर वो कुछ शब्द कहना चाहें इसमें तो अवश्य कहें डॉक्टर मनोज सर बहुत बहुत आभारी हूँ सर मैं एक्चुअली भूल गया था तो फिर इसने मल्लिका ने याद दिलाई हमको जबकि मैंने रिमाइंडर लगा रखा था अच्छा मैं सर सबसे फर्स्ट सुशील कुमार ओरेशन लेक्चर दिया था और मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगता है इससे जुड़ते हुए और आज बहुत कुछ नया कुछ हमको सीखने को मिला डॉक्टर ए के सिंह के टॉक के बाद क्योंकि हम चूंकि मरकुलर बायोलॉजी करते हैं तो हमें वो अदर पार्ट जो है फील्ड वाला एक्सटेंशन वाला उतना एक्सपोजर नहीं है बाकी आए इनका लेक्चर बहुत ही मतलब अच्छा था इस बारे में हम तो ज्ञानवर्धक हुआ इस इस एरिया में तो बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर फॉर डिलीवरिंग दिस इंटरेस्टिंग एंड एक्सलेंट टॉक सो दैट्स ऑल फ्रॉम माय साइड ओके तो डॉक्टर अशोक पिछली बार जो लेक्चर था ऑरेशन उसमें डॉक्टर मनोज प्रसाद ने बात की थी फीडिंग टेन बिलियन बाई ट्वेंटी फिफ्टी तो वो इनका टॉपिक था और मुझे ये बताते हुए खुशी है कि जो जिस थीम में हम उस समय चल रहे थे वो कृषि से खुशी था उससे पहले पोषण से रोशन था उससे पहले खेत से सेहत था और अब की जो चल रहा है जिसमें आपने ये शुरुआत करवाई है हमारी ये है फसल से सफल कि फसल से कैसे सफल हो सकते हैं हम तो उसमें आपने जो भविष्य दिखाया है वही इसका एक सारांश बन के आएगा थैंक यू सर थैंक यू so we have one more authority on the subject shashni sir is here if he wants to say something so just a few words because you are student shashil sir uh, first of all uh, let me tell that uh, grateful to you sir as uh, both the sir both are my teachers if i can say that dr uh, uh, khanuja sir as well as uh, ak singh sir uh, i have worked closely with him and i have listened to him earlier also ऑलवेज कुछ ना कुछ अच्छा सीखने के लिए मिलता है सर आपसे और राइस के केस में मैं हमेशा बोलता हूँ द फादर ऑफ राइस मॉडर्न राइस तो ये सिंगल सेंटेंस मेरा सब कुछ बोलता है और राइस के हम तो देश को आत्मनिर्भर करने में और एक्सपोर्ट करने में जो आपका हाथ है तो उसके लिए सदा ही सब लोग रिमेम्बर करेंगे आपको 
आप ऐसे मार्गदर्शन देते रहेगा हम लोगों को भी हम कुछ आपके जैसा रिसर्च करके आगे बढ़ सके और आपसे बहुत कुछ सीखने के लिए मिलता है थैंक यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू आई गॉट द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू लिसन टू यू अगेन बट ऑलवेज देर इज समथिंग न्यू कुछ ना कुछ नया मिलता है थैंक यू वेरी मच सर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू फॉर सो नाउ वी वुड लाइक टू प्रेजेंट अ प्लेक ऑफ ऑनर टू डॉक्टर ए के सिंह सर to honor and honor him as distinguished member of ffpc can we do that yes yes please so would you like to share a few line on this yeah so dr singh uh, as you have always backed us up uh, for many of our activities and your own scientific uh, contributions go into transforming agriculture in in a big way we would like to honor you with uh, this plaque of honor Uh, for this lecture as well as uh, having you as distinguished member of uh, flora fauna science foundation where we will like to, you to accept to be our, on our knowledge board and also uh, keep guiding us for how we can move forward congratulations and thank you so much for being with thank us you, thank you so much it's a real great honor for me and i'm so happy and so delighted thank you so much thank you sir So now at the juncture, I would request Dr. A K Singh Sir from Flora Puna Science Foundation for the vote of thanks. Sir, first of all, I am the speaker, Dr. Ashok Kumar Singh. I am very happy to be here today. He has taken his time to leave his own knowledge and knowledge to us, especially in the agriculture field. There is a lot of progress and there is a lot to be done. As you have told us, there is a way forward. There are a lot of new ideas. वो वास्तव में हम लोगों के लिए मतलब जो भी जहां तक हम सोच सकते हैं उससे भी बियॉन्ड चीजें हो रही हैं और आगे होंगी और इसी से हमारे प्लेनेट का सर्वाइवल संभव होगा आपने सही कहा कि टू फीड मल्टी बिलियन पॉपुलेशन नॉट ओनली ऑफ इंडिया बट द वर्ल्ड दिस ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन इन एग्रीकल्चर आर रिक्वायर्ड एंड थैंक यू फॉर स्पेयरिंग योर वेल्यूबल टाइम फॉर दिस वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव लेक्चर आ, हम आभारी हैं डॉक्टर मनोज प्रसाद जी के और डॉक्टर सासनी के जो कि आज पोजिशन में उपस्थित रहे और उन्होंने अपने विचार भी व्यक्त किए हम दोनों का हृदय से आभार व्यक्त करते हैं डॉक्टर ऋषि मुनि सिंह जो शायद फाइनल पे नहीं है लेकिन आ, मैं उनका भी आभारी हूँ डॉक्टर डी के यादव डॉक्टर अर्चना सुमन जी रेनू सिंह और समस्त जो लोग जुड़े हैं फेसबुक में और अभी बाद में यूट्यूब में भी पूरा लेक्चर वो देखेंगे फ्लोरा फोना साइंस फाउंडेशन के सौजन्य से हम सभी के बहुत आभारी हैं और जो भी अगर आपके कोई प्रश्न है या कोई कमेंट्स है जरूर शेयर करिए फ्लोरा फोना साइंस फाउंडेशन पर हम उसका उत्तर देंगे और डॉक्टर साहब को फिर अगली बार भी बुलाएंगे किसी नए टॉपिक के साथ किसी नए विषय के साथ आप सभी को डॉक्टर मनिका जिन्होंने इस कार्यक्रम को पोस्ट के रूप से संचालित किया हम बहुत आभारी हैं और हमारे फाउंडर चेयरमैन डॉक्टर खनुजा साहब जिन्होंने सारे प्रोग्राम को ऑर्गेनाइज किया पिछले वर्ष ये कार्यक्रम नहीं हो पाया इन कारणों से और आज वो संपन्न हो रहा है बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद और आगे भी हम इस वर्ष भी नए ओरिशन के साथ यहाँ उपस्थित होंगे इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ हम पुनः एक बार आप सभी को धन्यवाद देते हुए विदा लेते हैं थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच